I acquired the objects I, uh, through friends and family. You'd hear about a, a, a blue spot gramophone being disposed of, being thrown away, and I'd, I'd, be, I'd say, you know, could you give that to me, or records, or crochet, or plastic flowers, or a picture of Jesus at the Last Supper, or even a drinks cabinet. Then you have the settee, usually in maroon and usually velvet. You'd have the floral um, carpet, you'd have the floral wallpaper. You'd hear about, well, grandparents or parents had passed away, children now not knowing what to do with this stuff, whether to dump it or sell it. And I'd be there sometimes at the right time, at the right moment, and say, OK, I've got an exhibition. It could be used. Could you donate it? We, I've called it the West Indian front room because the, West, the term West Indian signifies a particular moment in the, in the history of black people in Britain. One, because at that time there were anti-colonial struggles going on. There was a civil rights movement. So it's, it marks that time. So it's very significant in terms of our experience. Also because it's a, a, a domestic space. And in the domestic space is revealed so much of our private desires, our private kind of identities, which are not necessarily in the public domain. But just as a room, I think it's, it's a room that's all over the African diaspora, from Brixton to Johannesburg to, to Kingston to Toronto to New York. And there are similar kind of uh, traits that exist and aesthetics exist within that, that front room. They were continuing practices which they had continued in the Caribbean. Out of colonialism, we came out of a system that was dehumanizing, and we had to reinvent ourselves and almost imitate the colonial, the white colonial classes and symbols of their kind of status and how they dress their home. And this was all part of kind of um, empowering ourselves, really, in a sense. It tells a narrative about the emergence and the process of our identity and how that has shifted and changed, but what also continues. So, for instance, having on the walls um, family photos, um, educational certificates, says something about our state of being that has not really changed because education is still very important within the black communities. Religion is still very important within the black communities, if only in, the, in a spiritual sense. And these, these symbols, these images, are represented all within the front room. So the front room says more than just, well, I'm a black British person in Britain and I'm trying to survive and moving on with my children getting educated. It says something about that sense of kind of desire. I think some of these, the fact that these sign of symbols echo all over the African diaspora said several things. One, about the idea of aspiration and ambition for newly arrived communities. Two, about the emergence of a kind of feminine practice within the domestic domain. And three, about kind of our identity. Because even now, black British third and second generation may resist some of that, maybe seen that kitsch, bad taste style, but have adopted and continue some of those practices. Black people usually socialized in each other's front room. The blue spot was very significant because uh, for a lot of clubs, often we were excluded from those spaces. For our, so our form of entertainment was Saturday night, friends and family coming around, um, drinking the um, baby sham or cherry bee or the um, ginger stones wine and playing maybe Elvis Presley, um, putting on Jim Reeves and having a good time. And, and so the front room served many, many functions. There is a similar room type of room that I've heard when I've created it, Irish uh, Migrants have come and talked about echoes of the similar things in that room. Italian, Jewish. Um, you, can, you can say immigrant communities have a similar type of room. Also, white working class. White working class families and communities have a similar room. And it's about aspiration. Uh, the, the significance for the, for the museum culture is that historically, the other, we, black people, have been the objects in the display cabinets, the objects within the museum. That is the history of our relationship with museum and museum culture. And as Edward Said has said, in terms of Orientalism, we are not the experts of our own culture. It's been the academy, it's been the museums, who have always been the experts of that. What's changed, I think, 
over the past 30, 40 years is a realization that the other, in this, in this case black communities, have not just been here since the end of the Second World War, but have been here for a couple hundred years. And they've impacted and influenced the national culture here. This, yeah? And so the term cultural diversity, I suppose, kind of relates to that. And there's now a shift in, in how and who represents those kind of cultural experiences within the museum. There's still questions about what it means and the notion of authenticity and who creates that. I mean, that's an ongoing debate. But I think certainly institutions such as the Victoria and Albert Museum and major um, institutions in London are beginning to realize slowly but surely that black people here have made a contribution, not just in terms of their own culture, but to British culture significantly. And I think that's what's significant about cultural diversity. It's not about separate cultures, it's about how really interdependent and integrated cultures really are. So in 1998, with the kind of whole Windrush celebration, that has opened up a whole kind of discourse, which I think a, a number of kind of institutions have tried to represent in terms of cultural diversity. Um, and a lot of oral stories now being told about experiences of West Indians when they came here in the 1950s and 1960s. The front room is another aspect of that narrative, in a sense. And I think the Jeffrey Museum have realized with their kind of rooms, 17th, 18th, 19th century period rooms, that the West Indian front room, one, needs to be legitimized because it's a significant contribution to British and social and design history. And it really says something about kind of how in during the 50s and 60s with the emergence of consumerism and consumer fetish and with um, kitsch, that this room here was actually being developed alongside other kind of developments being taken place in the 1960s, such as in clothes, such as in design and so forth. So it's part of a whole kind of narrative that's just much wider than, than simply the, um, the Jeffrey Museum, in a sense. What we may do is actually talk to West Indian elders about that room, it's because some of them still have that room, talking about that room, telling stories about that room, and how it relates to maybe their children and their children's children. Because the front room, what it does for me, is open up a whole discourse around a particular room. We don't see a lot of, 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 of black women um, having in the color supplements display in their own room. If they are, it's very much framed in, in, in terms of, let's look at cultural diverse, cult, multicultural Britain, as if the only way we can talk about race, the only way we can talk about these other people was it within that context, rather than, well, they're just ordinary people, in a sense, getting on with their lives and doing what other people do in terms of negotiating what goes into their home, whether they can afford it or not. It's not really different from anybody else whether they go out to Argos or go up to Ikea and they can afford what they want. It's no different. But somehow in, within the kind of mainstream dominant representation, black people seem to do things differently from everybody else. And I think there's a need to subvert that and change that and challenge that in a sense.